Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of Inside the Naval Postgraduate School. From our campus in Monterey, California, I'm your host Alan Richmond right here on the Pentagon Channel. Welcome to the show. Well on this episode, we'll cover all the activities that took place at the 31st Annual Fleet Week celebration up in San Francisco, California. And of course, NPS was there. We were on hand to participate and film many of the activities during the celebration. Here's the executive director of Fleet Week, Louis Leuven, to give us an overview of all the activities. Louis, what a big event you have in store for us this year. Thank you, Alan, and thank you for coming out here with the Naval Post Graduate School. They're wonderful partners in the program here. This year we're doing, as we did for the last two years, emphasizing humanitarian assistance and disaster response missions of the military. And we've really formed an incredible bond between the military and the civilian emergency response community in the Bay Area. Uh, the lead agency that we work with for planning exercises, San Francisco Department of Emergency Management, and they've reached out to all the branches of the military, federal and state, federal, state and local partners throughout the region to create just a fabulous program to help us all work together to better respond to disasters. Now, over a million people come to this event. That's quite an impact on the city of San Francisco and a great uh, gathering for the military, isn't it? Oh, it really is. And San Francisco opens the doors up for the military. They go into the restaurants and the bars. I ran into a uh, handful of sailors last night. I started talking to them and they were just absolutely thrilled at the fact that they had all gone into a restaurant, sat down and bought, uh, ordered a, a wonderful meal. They were prepared to pay for the check, and the restaurant owner came over and said, I'm sorry, but somebody's already taken care of this meal for you. So they were very happy to be in San Francisco. I think San Francisco is a wonderful liberty call. We also had the opportunity to speak with San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee and find out his thoughts on Fleet Week. I'm very lucky to be the mayor of San Francisco. We are so appreciative of our Fleet Week, uh, obviously to... Uh, give a very strong nod a whole week to our men and women in uniform, to our leaders in the military from the Navy, to the Coast Guard, to the Marines. Uh, but we're also doing something in addition to that that's very special to our city. We're really practicing what it takes to get ready for a major disaster and experiencing uh, the on-the-ground uh, movement and logistics expertise of our military to help us in time of need. Well, the city of San Francisco has certainly thrown out the welcome mat, so thank you very much. Thank you, and let's celebrate that, but let's also uh, make sure we're also paying attention to what we have to be prepared for, and this is why we're right down to our neighborhoods, very thankful to our military. Well, special thanks to San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee for taking time to talk with us. Well, one of the other important activities associated with Fleet Week celebration is the Senior Leadership Seminar. The Senior Leadership Seminar provides a platform for senior leaders from the U.S. military, state, local, and federal emergency response agencies, and community leaders to continue to develop working relationships and encourage cooperative emergency planning. As a follow-up to the 2011 SLS, in August, approximately 24 civilian and military organizations participated in a cooperative, functional exercise to evaluate tactical emergency route opening activities 72 hours post-disaster and a drill that tested interoperable communication coordination and interagency information exchange. An exercise briefback was conducted aboard the USS Macon Island, who hosted the seminar this year. One of the important topics discussed at the SLS was cybersecurity, and NPS professor Cynthia Irvine was there to moderate the panel. Well, cyber and protection of the network, everybody is concerned about that. That's not just the military, but it's every single U.S. citizen and people all over the world, isn't it? Oh, yes. Well, and particularly here in the United States, because we're ahead of a lot of countries in cyber, and so we're more dependent upon it by being a more advanced country. Now, everybody has devices now. I mean, it, we live in a world that you can't get people to talk almost anymore. They're at the table, they're texting, they're doing all these things. Do you think that people put too much information out there? I'm not talking just about military now, but don't people divulge an awful lot, leave themselves vulnerable to people hacking them and that kind of thing? Uh, it's very easy to put out too much information. You can, just by making a phone call, uh, reveal information. A lot of 800 numbers, uh, they record uh, the calling number, for example. Uh, and there are automated ways of doing this. In the past, we didn't uh, have the capability of collecting and storing as much information as there is now. And so people are often doing the same sort of things that they might have done 10 or 15 years ago, but the collectors uh, and this may be corporate collectors, not necessarily government ones, uh, 
are able to amass large databases so that they can determine what you might want to buy next. Uh, and this information may not be what you really want other people to know. Now we can't go into great detail about what you and your colleagues will be talking about today on cyber, but it does play into the theme of Fleet Week, which is uh, disaster control around the world and how that technology plays into it. Is that part of what you're looking at? Well, the military depends uh, a lot on uh, communications, and uh, the cyber communications uh, is a large part of that. Uh, our communications around the world uh, require us to have ship-to-ship -ship communications, ship-to-shore, uh, ship-to-satellite, back to the United States types of communications. And so in uh, the context of a disaster, you need to keep those communications up and going. Well, we'd certainly like to thank everyone who participated in the Senior Leadership Seminar during Fleet Week. We'll be back with more Fleet Week activities right after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Inside NPS in San Francisco, California. Well, time now to board the USS Macon Island. While aboard the USS Macon Island, we had the privilege to meet and speak with the commanding officer, Captain Cedric Pringle, a native of Sumter, South Carolina. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in economics and received his commission via the NROTC from the University of South Carolina in 1986. He earned his master's degree in systems management and national security strategy from the Naval Postgraduate School and the Naval War College, respectively. Captain Pringle reported to the USS Macon Island as the executive officer in August of 2010 and took command as the ship's third commanding officer in February of 2012. We had the opportunity to tour the ship and participate in the senior leadership seminar. Here's Captain Cedric Pringle. Well, Macon Island is the uh, ace ship of the WASP class LHDs. We're an amphibious uh, assault ship, uh, so we bring a lot of uh, helo capabilities and vertical lift capability to the fight, as well as the uh, possibility of using the well deck for LCACs and LCUs. Uh, that capability certainly works well in an HADR type mission uh, where we have to provide humanitarian assi assistance and disaster relief. Uh, the thing that's different about Macon Island than the other sister ships in our class is that we have an e electric propulsion drive system. A hybrid system actually allows us to save quite a bit of fuel. On our most recent uh, deployment of seven months, we were able to save $15 million of fuel over the course of that seven month period just by using our electric drive at slower speeds. Uh, the, the, the other interesting thing about our ship is that we've got just a phenomenal, uh, very talented crew who all just strive forward uh, with the culture of excellence in mind. Talk a little bit about the type of aircraft that come aboard and the capabilities of takeoffs and landings. Well, the LHD has the opportunity to operate with just about any type of aircraft in the Navy's uh, afloat uh, aircraft inventory. Uh, we have MV-22s on board here for San Francisco Fleet Week. We also have uh, Cobras. Uh, uh, we also have uh, 53s on board in the SX-60. Uh, but we also have the opportunity to operate with Harriers uh, should we see a need to do that as well. So. Very, very flexible, uh, air-capable platform. Well, one of the big uh, bottom lines of Fleet Week, of, uh, of course, is disaster preparedness around the world and how the military fits into that big picture. And you have quite a medical facility. We had an opportunity to tour. Talk a little bit about that. The medical facility on board the LHD-class ships is probably the best medical facility afloat right behind the uh, USNS Mercy and Comfort, which are designed as hospital ships. Our capability uh, certainly starts with the flight deck and being able to receive casualties back on board, uh, our personnel that we need to assist, bring them back on board on the flight deck, bring them through flight deck triage, process them down to our medical capabilities. We, we have uh, six operating rooms on board should we need to do that. Uh, then we have another 15, room, rooms in our, 15 beds in our uh, ICU, our intensive care room, and then another 40 beds or so in our, um, in our primary ward and we have an overflow capability of about 250 additional beds. So very, very robust um, medical capability. We're proud to say that you're a Naval Postgraduate School alum. Absolutely, and uh, even in 2010 when we came up, I uh, had an opportunity to do an interview. Uh, the true irony of uh, being a Naval Postgraduate School alum and being on the ship is that on my thesis, I actually worked on a smart gator concept and part of that uh, thesis talked about the machinery control system. That machinery control system is now used on board this ship. So although it's a, quite a few years removed, it's great to see the body of work that I did at the Naval Postgraduate School actually come to life in the, in the shape of a ship here on board. So uh, for any, any students that are toiling through uh, the, 
the, the rigors of academia there at Naval Postgraduate School, my advice to them would be stick with it. It is certainly worth it, and nothing's better than being in, immersed in an academic environment and putting all your time and effort into doing something worthy, or worthy that could help influence the Navy in the future. So it is definitely worth it, and uh, certainly proud to be a part of the Naval Postgraduate, uh, Postgraduate School Alumni Association. Well, sir, congratulations, and thank, thank you. you for your service, and thanks for hosting us aboard the Macon Island. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, we offer our sincerest thanks to Captain Pringle and the fine crew of the USS Macon Island for their courtesy during our stay. One of the other participants is very well known. Here's George Schultz, former Secretary of State. George Schultz is an economist and Republican presidential advisor, best known as the Secretary of State, who was sworn in on July 16, 1982, as the 60th U.S. Secretary of State and served until January 1989 under President Ronald Reagan. He graduated from Princeton in 1942 with an economics degree and served in combat operations in the Pacific as a United States Marine during World War II. Leaving the Corps as a major, he earned a Ph.D. in industrial economics from MIT. He taught there and was a professor and dean at the University of Chicago from 1962 to 1968, and then a fellow at Stanford University's Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences before serving as Secretary of Labor, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and Secretary of the Treasury under President Nixon. He returned to the private sector in 1974 and became president of the Bechtel Group, a San Francisco-based engineering and construction firm. He left his post there to replace Alexander Haig as Secretary of State in 1982. He served for the remainder of President Reagan's term and is credited with being the architect of the national security strategy that ended the Cold War. In January 1989, he rejoined Stanford University as the Jack Steele Parker Professor of International Economics at the Graduate School of Business and as a distinguished fellow at the Hoover Institution. We had the honor of speaking with him at the Senior Leadership Seminar aboard the USS Macon Island. Now, you've been, sir, in government service for many, many years, most of your life. What's your overview of today's U.S. military? Well, our military is extraordinary. It's not just that they're the best in the world. They're just top-notch in every respect. And you know it immediately when you start talking to uh, the people in the military. They're terrific people. And they're dedicated and professional. And you look around this ship at the equipment here, what they can do. So they've got the tools, we've got the people. It's, that's all. You are now at the Hoover Institute at Stanford. What kind of work are you doing these days? Well, I work on the economy, ideas about the economy, and we write stuff about that. I work along with uh, former Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry, who's there and Sam Nunn, who's a uh, visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, and Henry Kissinger, who will be a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. We work on how can we make the world safer in terms of nuclear weapons, eventually getting rid of them, the step-by-step -step process that we need to go through. I work on the subject of energy. I worry about problems of governance. I worry about how we make our diplomacy more effective. So I've got my hands full. That's a big, that's a big menu. I know that uh, you'll be coming down to the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey after the first of the year, and we're looking forward to your visit. And we're going to be having a discussion on energy. Can you give me a little preview about the kind of work and what that message will be to the Naval Postgraduate School? Well, the Naval Postgraduate School has, among other things, a major program on the subject of energy. And we have a program as well. So we look forward to a fruitful collaboration between the two of us so both can benefit and learn. My own perspective on energy right now is that in the United States, we have a gigantic opportunity to change the energy picture drastically if we take advantage of our opportunities. And it's always a question. We have, more than any other time before, a very large scientific and engineering base of people in universities around the country. I know about Stanford and I know about MIT because I'm involved in both of those, where they're doing a lot of work on how you get better energy out of the sun, 
out of wind, how you convert cellulostic materials into energy, how you use different means of propulsion, how you work to see ways where you can use less energy to get the same job done and so on. And these are long run efforts that will pay off so that we can meet the three big things we have to do in energy. We have to think about our national security. Among other things, that means learning how to produce energy where you use it, so you don't have a big supply line. We have to think about our economy, which uses energy, vitally important. And we have to think about our environment, the air you breathe, the climate that we're creating, and doing something about it. So we're on the cusp of being able to do something about all of those things. Well, we appreciate your fine work and your service to our country, sir, and around the globe. We look forward to seeing you at the Naval Postgraduate School. Look forward to being there. Thank, Thank you. you sir. Special thanks to Mr. Schultz for taking time to speak with us during the SLS. And we look forward to having him visit the Naval Postgraduate School just after the first of the year. Well, time now to board another ship. Here we are at the USS Spruance. Well, while at Fleet Week, we were privileged to meet Commander George Kessler, Jr., commanding officer of the USS Spruance. He's a native of Albany, Missouri. He entered the United States Naval Academy in 1991, graduated with a Bachelor's of Science degree, and was commissioned as an ensign in 1995. Commander Kessler holds a Master of Arts in National Security Affairs from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. Here's Captain George Kessler. A USS Spruance was commissioned on October 1st of 2011. We're the newest Harley Burke class destroyer on the waterfront. We actually will maintain that distinction for about six more days when DDG 111, 111 is replaced by 112 as the newest destroyer. Uh, we were commissioned in Key West, Florida. Uh, we are a flight to alpha variant of the Harley Burke destroyer, which means that we're able to carry helicopters on board. We have actual helo hangers. Uh, we're a multi-mission destroyer, which means we can deal with anti-air threats, we can deal with surface threats, we can deal with subsurface threats, and we can operate in maritime and interdiction operations. Fleet Week is so special in that we get an opportunity to share with the American public what their tax dollars have gone for. It gives us an opportunity to expose uh, members of the United States that may not uh, know or have a heritage uh, with the Navy to what we do, what our sailors do to uh, help them recognize uh, what their tax dollars have paid for, help them understand what missions we employ. The San Francisco Fleet Week has actually established a huge humanitarian assistance disaster relief component to its makeup, and so it's actually really neat in which the, uh, the local agencies here in San Francisco and the Greater Bay Area can actually work with the government and the, specifically the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps and actually see what we bring to that mission and how we can help them accomplish what they need to do if the, a disaster did strike. So our crew is 282 people, it's roughly around 34 officers right now and 248 sailors. Uh, we have 19 countries represented, we have every state in the union represented. We're right now about 20% uh, women on board and uh, come from all over and been together for about two years now uh, through the pre-commissioning process and now into our first year of commission. I had a wonderful time at the Naval Postgraduate School. I actually went there uh, for a National Security Affairs degree. Uh, my focus was on Central and Eastern Europe uh, and my thesis was on the Ukrainian Navy. Uh, but also I enjoyed the time just getting to know other uh, shipmates, other officers, both uh, from the United States Navy but also from National Guard, the Army, the Air Force and from uh, foreign countries and ministries of defense. I also had the rare privilege of meeting my wife in uh, Monterey. She was working at Pebble Beach, so for me, Monterey has a special place in my heart, has a special place in my family. I have two other siblings who have also received degrees from MPS, so uh, love it there. Would gladly go back in a heartbeat. We also had the pleasure of participating in the parade of ships, being aboard the USS Spruance, as well as many other ships that passed beneath the Golden Gate and the Bay Bridges in San Francisco. In fact, here's a list of some of the other ships that participated. We'll stay with us more to come from Fleet Week in San Francisco as we turn our attention to the Marina Green and the cruiser team from NPS right here on the Pentagon Channel. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Inside NPS. During Fleet Week, there was also a peer-to-peer -peer medical exchange, which included a Battlefield Emergency Medicine Conference. 
We also viewed the landing of a landing craft air cushion, or LCAC. That was on Ocean Beach in San Francisco. We participated in a helicopter lift and saw a demonstration of static military medical capabilities. Two days were focused on tours of the shock trauma platoon on the Marina Green to continue dialogue between civilian and military medical professionals. The public had the opportunity to see the new technology, including the team from NPS showcasing our consortium for robotics and unmanned systems education and research, or CRUISER. CRUISER is a Secretary of the Navy initiative to align disparate efforts in unmanned systems technology. Unmanned systems and technology is changing so quickly and growing and there are so many different efforts at so many different, not only DOD commands, but in industry and academia that could benefit from aligning and sharing resources, sharing information and Cruiser, our primary mission is to develop that community of interest. At Fleet Week here, we have talked to a wide variety of people. Um, a lot of people just coming to ask, what is Naval Postgraduate School? What do we do? So we've, it's provided us the opportunity to really share what goes on at Naval Postgraduate School, who we serve, and we've had a lot of young sailors come and ask us, here's where I am in my career, how do I get to where you are, what do you suggest my next steps are? So it's been really great to have some students here to help them navigate where they are and how to get to Naval Postgraduate School. It's Commander Jeff Hunk. I'm currently on faculty at MPS. I'm a prior student. I graduated in 2007 from the Ops Research School. Uh, liked my time, enjoyed the, uh, the, the curriculum there, and uh, tried to line myself up for a staff job, uh, and it worked out, and I just returned to NPS last month as a military faculty. Uh, this is Fleet Week here, so this is the Navy's chance to uh, talk to or engage with the public on uh, the activities within the armed services, let them know uh, about opportunities such as the uh, postgraduate school for folks who are already in the service, tell them about uh, the benefit of those degrees and the, the, what those degrees bring to the Department of Defense and to, uh, and to the nation for uh, keeping our officer corps educated and uh, engaged in, uh, in current topics and research areas. We talk with a lot of uh, younger folks who are uh, they're here to take a look at the, the Navy demonstrator next door here, uh, but they also come over and take a look at some of the, uh, the remote control planes and gliders that we have. Uh, they're fascinated by those. They're asking uh, a lot of uh, interesting questions about how they work, uh, what we use those for. Uh, we explain to them that many of those are uh, affiliated with the, uh, the Cruiser project, which uh, is uh, involved in researching unmanned systems, and it's an engagement uh, opportunity for us to tell them about those opportunities for research and education. Uh, talk about uh, how unmanned systems are being researched within the armed services for uh, possible missions and uh, employment uh, overseas. And uh, the, uh, the vehicles that we have here to talk about are uh, used for basic level research. Uh, we have PhD faculty and uh, military students uh, using them to explore different concepts of operations and different ways of uh, using them to achieve military objectives. So that's pretty interesting. And uh, of course the kids just like to come up and, uh, and uh, tweak the, uh, the fins on the planes and uh, take a look at the propeller and uh, talk about how it works and how it communicates with either a phone or a computer and uh, what kind of interesting things you can do with them. Uh, I did spend uh, two years here in a graduate program several years ago. Uh, it was a challenging uh, program. I went through the operations research uh, curriculum, which is a lot of computer simulation, data analysis, those type of things, which uh, really advanced my education personally and it allowed me to be a more effective officer and some follow-on jobs and uh, perform some analysis work for the Navy. So the education was great. I enjoyed my time. It was quite challenging. And last but not least, of course, is the air show. the ever-popular air show, featuring the Blue Angels under beautiful sunny skies. The Angels were established in 1946 by order of Chester W. Nimitz, the Chief of Naval Operations. They performed at Craig Field in Jacksonville, Florida for the very first time that year and continue to be a crowd favorite today with a maximum speed of just under Mach 2 or about 1,400 miles an hour. Other exciting aircraft featured were the F-22 Raptor, the new Air Force fighter aircraft. The F-22 is a critical component of the Global Strike Task Force. It's designed to project air dominance rapidly and at great distances. The F-22 cannot be matched by any known or projected fighter aircraft. United Airlines flew one of the largest commercial aircraft in operation at slow speed for a real bird's eye view of the bay. There was an amazing aerobatic display by Lucas Better hold on to your hat for this one and fasten your seatbelt. This is definitely an A-ticket ride. 
And finally, our friends to the north, the Canadians, joined in with both ships and aircraft. The CF-18 demonstration team personifies the excellence required to keep the Royal Canadian Air Force among the best aviation organizations on the planet. The air show was another success. Well, before we leave you with this episode, if you'd like to follow activities or learn more about the Naval Postgraduate School using social media, here's how. You know you can get the latest news and information on the Naval Postgraduate School as it happens through the university's official Twitter site. Follow NPS and stay connected and stay informed at twitter.com slash NPS Monterey. Well, that's it for this edition of Inside the Naval Postgraduate School, on location in San Francisco at the 31st Annual Fleet Week Activity Celebration. Thanks for joining us. We'll look for you next time at Spay War in San Diego on Inside NPS here on the Pentagon Channel. Bye-bye, everyone.